Hi folks. This is one of those layman pascals and today we're going to make queer liminal a thing. What does that mean? Well, we're looking at the intersections and overlaps between three types of stuff, which are the shamanic experience, the liminal web, and the queer and trans experience. They all have certain things in common. There's a shared notion of transformation. There's a sense of being between or outside conventional identities. There's a perspective related to but distinct from the general tribe that's haunted by the ambiguous sense of the outsider who is among us and by the uncertain status that this inside outsider ought to have in our culture. So given these obvious resonances, why isn't there more generative cross-pollination and productive discourse between these quasi-communities? And what sorts of directions might emerge if they more thoroughly informed each other? That's Queer Liminal. And here to help me explore this is the person from whom the phrase first burst forth, and who apparently shares four Facebook friends with me, Rachel Hayden. Hi, Rachel. <laughs> hey, Layman. I am loving being here already. <laughs> Okay, I have this impression that the reason we don't see more queer presencing built into liminal, metamodern, integrative, and polyepistemic discourse communities is primarily because most of the people in these spaces don't have much personal information about it. Mm -hmm. It's clearly a social issue everyone hears about, and these are clearly um, overtly integrative, inclusive, diversity-respecting communities, but it's actually pretty hard to get good personal information for shared sense making around these things. You'd have to uh, know people who've lived through queer and trans experience. They would have to feel okay sharing that with you. And they would also have to be the kind of people that you trusted as nuanced, depth-oriented sense makers. Mm -hmm. That means that so-called second-tier communities need plausibly second-tier folks to give them live to data that's not distorted by reactive paradigms, gay may thinking, regressive tribal identities, broken pluralism, all that kind of stuff. So first, I want to know if you agree with that in general. And then if you do, maybe you'd be willing to help us out by sharing a bit of the journey through life that leads you to be here interested in both queer and liminal things. Yes. Okay. First one, <laughs> one point of order. I'm still a newbie here. What does second tier community mean? Similar to liminal, right? It's the it's a phrase okay. that comes out of spiral dynamics and integral, where you've got all these historically unfolded paradigms, and then you have these new sensibilities that want to take care for and yet not get caught in any of those emergent paradigms. Mm, uh, meta okay. communities. Yeah. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. I'm always like, you know, liminal sense making, meta, 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 this and that. I don't know, you know, yeah. like, but yeah, that makes. I totally agree with all that all that you said. Um, with partial exception, like I feel like some of you know, there are definitely inclusiver areas of the liminal web than others. Like there's definitely some, I would say, full on anti-trans participants as well. And like, so it's a mix. And and um, I think you gotta be a little tough, you gotta be a little thick-skinned to participate, at least to be in like the first wave or whatever, you know, as well as not like adhering to a super strong identity politics model of who you are, you know, if you can kind of let go of that, it makes it a lot easier to explore, even, you know, opinions that are like opposed to your existence to some extent. So how did you get here interested in living through both of these things, queer and liminal, so to speak? Yeah, yeah, pretty much at the same time where, I was like coming to grips with being trans and trying to figure out what to do about that. You know, there's a difference between predisposition and actually transitioning or claiming that as an identity or working toward that. Um, and I was, I encountered, of course, John Verveke's work as many do. Um, and I was, I was just, you know, blown away by what he was doing with awakening from the meaning crisis and, it just, it hit me at, at such a time as I was already in such a depth of like existential crisis um, myself that it just blew my mind completely. And I was like, listening to him talk about, you know, the transformative experience and the authors that he was referring to um, with regard to that. And I was, I started reading them and I was just like, this is such a, there's such a better model here for being trans than the normal cultural you know, like, um, you just identify with this, you have a flag, you plant it, and you, you know, you're good, and then no one else can disrespect you or whatever, like, there's kind of a all or nothing 
view that I was I was getting. It was either like you know you don't exist, you're you're mentally ill or you're fake or whatever, or like you are you are a woman, like just be that and you're fine, just express yourself, right? And so I was like, but I don't know, like I have an inner femininity. I felt like my soul was female. And that led in some parts to like my bot embodied experience, but also like, I could, I didn't feel like I could claim the term woman, like right off the bat, it felt like a really, um, I don't, I don't want to say arrogant because I, I don't think everyone is arrogant who's doing that, but I just felt like it was like way too soon. Like, do not go there yet. You're not ready both inwardly and outwardly. So I used that kind of pathway that, that John helped lay out and, um, in thinking about, gender transition as really becoming a new person in some ways with new values, new worldview, um, leaning into my predispositions, you know, but not relying on who I was at the time and just like selecting, oh, I'm just going to like wear more pink now and I'm going to get some boobs and it's going to be great, you know, like, but like, how do I become that person in that mysterious way that requires like inner and outer transjective change to occur? So I don't know if that makes sense, but that's kind of the the basics <laughs> no that's a great uh that's a great way to start situating this conversation and for people to know um you know the vibe the framework the uh, the personal ethos you're coming from on this mm -hmm. now it, it's interesting you mentioned that there are whatever we would say hardliners <laughs> anti-trans elements even in liminal and meta-modern spaces and they have some interesting arguments to make but you know, the the emotional tone that comes out in that always surprises me because the thing that stands out to me personally about trans folk is is the sheer neatness of it. Mm. Like uh, if you told me a person was restructuring their body to accommodate their sense of themselves, I'd be like, OK, wow, that's really neat. What a strange, interesting thing for a human being to do. Tell me more. So it, like it's such a fascinating thing to do. Why aren't more people, even in advanced discourse spaces, more just straightforwardly curious about it? Yeah, totally. You know, my friend Adriana Nally would say that oh, there's a lot of fear in culture in general. And I think um, from my participation so far in these spaces, like, I think there can be kind of a, a sort of a spiritual bypassing or philosophical bypassing that occurs and people where it's like, oh, we're just over gender. We're like, we got this figured out, you know, and people haven't necessarily done the work on this issue. And they kind of want to like wrap it up and then give in to maybe some of the darker elements of the culture wars without, you know, just kind of like backdoor that stuff in here. There's, you know, there's also like a lot of resonance between um, more traditional religious elements and parts of the sense making web. So you know, there's that push and pull there. I'm not going to say like, oh, that's that's bad or whatever. But like, I think that can be kind of a deterrent for people to think like, oh, this is a neat thing. Like, like, what are these people doing? And it's like really crazy, um, you know. The uh, yeah, the religious thing is interesting. I'm I was thinking this morning, like, what what are the arguments that I usually hear on transgender issues? Right. And, and some of the arguments are obviously kind of false in the sense that they're just taking sides in a culture war and going against everything you associate with the rival team. So I put that aside. When it comes to argumentation, I hear kind of three things. The first is the religious thing in its broadest sense. Like I hear people say, mm, transgender degrades the sacred arrangement of culture that's based on the dictates of the mythic God or the poetic intention of nature that predetermined our forms and functions. And that even if that feels unnatural, we're all supposed to suck it up and do the job the boss laid out for us. Yeah. Um, up, buttercup. That's, that gets pretty dubious if you don't agree with a mythic conformist version of the divine or with poetic projection onto the perfect omniscience of nature, or if you're some depraved Marxist who thinks deep obedience to the boss is pretty dubious. <laughs> Uh, the second argument I hear a lot is that we're drifting further into the meaning crisis by undermining scientific determinations about the genetic meaning of gender. Mm -hmm. And the third I thing I hear, yeah, I, I put push back on each of these. I'll just say the third thing and then I'll get your feedback here. Yeah. The third thing is people are so dumb that there's a danger of a popular social fad that causes people to rush simplistically to support uh, 
trans trenders mistaking their complex feelings about gender for some simple radical restructuring of physiology. And right. people seem especially agitated about that if they imagine vapid liberal parents obeying their irrational children who claim to be alternatively gendered because they heard about it at school or on social media. So totally. those are the three things I hear. Are, are they yeah. roughly the same things you hear? And, and how do they land with you? Really good um, triple umbrella there, I think. And they all, you know, there's partial truth, I think, to all of them, really. Like, I, I don't, I can't say zero for the first one. <laughs> I would get kind of, I would be like, well, if you know anything about primates and indigenous, you know, people like probably that's, that's kind of a not entirely accurate argument, you know, but they, they all like the second one, especially like I do actually, I do fear a loss of what gender means in this culture. And in that way, I think I'm actually closer to like a truly gender fundamentalist person than a lot of people who are anti-trans in a way. Like I believe in gender. I'm a gender realist. Like I think it, you know, it exists in in primates of all types, including us, um, and it serves functions. And then those functions may be variable and maybe flexible, and maybe not everyone fits into the boxes, right? But like to say, like, oh, there's no such thing; it's only sex, or to say gender is what you make of it, um, are both like way off the mark to me, you know. So that part I get, you know. I think like you know, if you look at any of the like the the you know, I'm not like a scientist, but you know, broad disclaimer, but like Robert Sapolsky and Franz de Waal, like some of the, the bigger names in, in science, in biology and primatology, like they'll be kind of pointing to all these examples of research on transgender people and primates saying like, look, there's brain differences, you know, there may be genetic links, you know, the, it, this seems to run in families, it seems to run in identical twins more than fraternal twins. You have chimps that apparently act like a transgender person would, you know, so I, I agree. This is where I'm kind of like, yeah, like science does matter, actually. You know, um, some trans people would disagree there. You know, it's more about a liberation argument, be who you are, um, which I totally find valid, too. But yeah, for me, for me, actually, I started transitioning like shortly after hearing Robert Sapolsky speak um, on chronic pain and then just randomly answering a question from the audience about about trans brains. And he was like, yeah, absolutely. It's one of the like clearest findings in neuroscience so far that trans people's brains match the identity that they are going for, that they claim, whether it's pre or post um, hormone replacement therapy. Um, and I think, you know, there's been, there have been more studies since then, and I'm not sure of the exact exactness of that, but I don't want to get too bogged down in it. But I, I do feel like what I share with them is, or some of them, I should say, is actually gender realism. You know, it's important. Gender, gender is a potent force. It can be used for good also. And it doesn't have to just be our enemy, like an oppressive evil force, like a lot of, I think, people that I, I hang out with would kind of think of it as. So that's number two. What was number three again? We were talking about. Uh, the third one was the, the sort of the risk of social hysteria and social fads and a bunch right. of people who uh, really shouldn't be uh, physically transitioning, sort of getting on the bandwagon enthusiastically and not thinking too much about it and reducing the complexity to a very simple binary choice about restructuring their bodies. Yeah, also agree there, you know, and it's funny because like the same arguments are the ones that I think about from like my side of the issue. Um, I, I don't really, I mean, I don't know how much of a trans contagion there really is like that. I feel like the numbers are all being thrown around. And at this point, it's like such a data tornado fight that I, I don't even know like how to, to parse any of it. I do think, I mean, with a lot of trans people, if you are paying like attention, respectful attention as an adult, and this is where kids just kind of need that open attention given to them right over time, then you start to see patterns emerge in behavior, like being, you know, similar to being left-handed. Like you just see this kid doing this thing with their left hand, you know, like that's interesting. And maybe later, you know, they claim the identity of being left-handed or something, but, you know, I, I definitely wouldn't say, <laughs> I definitely agree that they're, there is some danger in, and it, it actually ties in with the second issue you raised, you know, because if we reduce gender to like nothingness and we, we don't pay attention to its reality, you know, scientifically or otherwise, then what's the point of it? You know, like, what are, what are we even doing here? So if you just say, oh, this is something 
I'm just going to claim this identity. Um, I'm a teenager. I suddenly I'm going to be this gender and claim it. You know, it does sound like someone wanting to be a furry or something, you know. And again, like I'm not trying to discredit a lot of people. I don't know how how real this this contagion trans trender thing is. I'm sure there is like with anything, there's some people, right? You know, but I feel I feel like yeah. you know over time you're you're having these conversations, you're interacting with people, and that's what we we need in general in life, right? Like we need like people adults to be paying attention to kids in an open, respectful way that gives them some boundaries and also like lets and and really observes who they are with as few preconceptions as possible. Yeah, it seems like we need, at the very least, like a wise filtering system for how we sort of collectively process people in this. Like there should be, there's a wisdom differential between adults and kids. Uh, there should be a wisdom differential between sages and adults or however John Verveke would like to phrase it. And the, the system should be informed by as much wisdom as possible and have you know, benevolent, intelligent ways of listening and interceding to sort of organize people, figure out where they are in a gradient of the motives they have. Right. Um, right. Yeah. The, the thing that popped up for me, though, is I've listened to Sapolsky a little bit on this, and I it gives me an image of what I would call maybe complex emergent gender realism. Mm -hmm. Because he he discusses a whole set of nested biological and even psychosocial layers where these things could operate. And that fits very nicely with a lot of the things in the liminal space. So yes. People like Ken Wilber and Greg Henriquez have been very strong on a, an evolved stack of evolutionary functions that make up a human being. And it seems yeah. like there are ways to be more male or female, genetically, hormonally, neurologically, psychosocially, and that these layers also interact with each other. Do you, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Do you think of gender in like a, a layered evolutionary sense? Absolutely. Absolutely. I did a video with Greg and John Verveke on this like a little while ago where I kind of laid out the pro some of the problems with looking at gender as like purely biological, purely animal mental, according to Greg, you know, purely cultural you know, or, or two of those three even, you know, and how we need to think of it as this really complex emerging thing. And anytime, you know, if we people on the pro trans side or whatever, like will accuse anti-trans people of gender essentialism. And I think that's true a lot. It's also true though of the pro-trans side when it essentializes toward culture, you know, and says gender is a social construct period. Like, yes, it is. And it's also a biological reality related linked to sex, you know, and it's, it's hard linked to sex, you know, pretty, for most people, it's pretty tightly linked. A um, few of us, it's a little loose, but, um, you know, it's also linked to the mental, psychological level and who you aspire to become and how you process your evolution as, and development as a person. So this is why I'm kind of like, I don't, I don't see gender as being something that's completely solid and like for all time gender is like this. And I don't see it as being something that's completely fluid and loose either, but something that maybe responds to the needs of any given culture and the individuals within that culture. So it's kind of like, you know, giving us like gravitational attractors to play with as individuals. And hopefully we can harness that, the tonos between the attractor and ourselves and use that to develop as a person. There's gonna be some tension there. We're not gonna fit any, no one fits any gender box, right? Um, so we can kind of play with that. And, you know, as soon as we're too far outside that and there's like a lot of tension there and we can't handle it, then something needs to give. And if there are enough people like that, I would say the culture should shift and open up some space. And if, you know, it's just a few individuals, eh, it's kind of hard, you know, because like, what do you do for those people? Are they just gonna be kind of cast out or, or not? But um, I would love to see kind of at this point, a more open space where we can just explore this stuff. I know it's kind of a little explosive and confusing and chaotic and, and probably adding fragmentation, like you said, to the mix, um, like people are fearing. Um, I think that's kind of necessary. It's necessary to make a mess, to clean it up, you know? We had all this shit in a box for a couple thousand years or a few thousand years, and we need to like unpack it and figure this out a little better. Yeah, in a lot of ways, that's no different than any other topic we face, whether it's something new like AI or whether it's something deeply ancient like 
everybody's experience of sexuality and physiology and things like that. Like if you dig into it, it's extremely complex and uh, you have to accept some degree of mess in order to start to do sense making in an area. Yep. I was thinking about, um, I mean, the, the conversation you and I originally connected on was sort of thinking about trans shadow. And mm -hmm. that's a, in some ways that's a dangerously easy thing to do because the, it might not be the first issue that's important, right? I'm, I'm very aware that I'm not in a situation where there are uh, mm, bullies threatening to attack me relative to my sexual or genderized identity. There aren't millions of people on television suggesting that I shouldn't even exist or have a mental illness. So that's a very different situation than the one I'm in. And I don't want to jump past that because that may be the first thing to secure before we go into deeper conversations. But if we feel reasonably secure, then there are a lot of other things to consider. And it makes a difference in moving this into liminal conversations, because these conversations, which are often explicitly metamodern as opposed to postmodern and integrative as opposed to pluralistic, there's a, mm -hmm. there's a sense that in these communities that people who think they're at the leading edge of social progress are often making no qualitative distinctions between healthy and unhealthy versions of what they're doing. Mm -hmm. Where does a vocal progressive act like a regressive? What mm -hmm. would pathology look like in the trans community? What are the dangers of over-identification? What are the risks of ignoring the full spectrum of different motives? So mm -hmm. these questions, you know, they shouldn't undermine the validity of people's efforts to make the world a more fair and depressurized place, but they are considerations that are important to determining whether one's speaking from an embedding in postmodern activism or from an authentically emergent liminal place. What's your sense of that tension and where does your thinking go on the subject of trans shadow? Completely. Um, that That's like the thing that you had written that I like overheard over overlooked <laughs> overread that's a better way to put it you know and I was like oh this guy we I want to stir the pot with layman because I I do feel and I, I you know with regard to these spaces like people coming in are gonna have to deal with their shit you know like all around and it you know I definitely wouldn't want to see any kind of like I don't want to pick on wokeism because it seems like anti-wokeism is like the new wokeism, but I don't want to see people coming in and being like, you have to just, you know, respect this and sort of like barging in with like every shadow part and they're above criticism and beyond reproach. And anytime you criticize them, it's because you're a transphobe or something. Like, I feel like people do fear that in these spaces and, and with good reason, I've heard people tell me this, you know? So I think that it, with regard to just these communities in particular, it's an important thing to bring up. You know, maybe in the in the wider world right now, it is, you know, I, I feel personally, you know, it's a very threatening time in the United States where I can't use the bathroom in Kansas, for instance. <laughs> so I can I can all I also vibe with that a lot too. like like, OK, we just need to, like, get some liberation happening. But at the same time. It's not the only issue on the planet, obviously, like there aren't that many of us. I mean, there are the queer people in general are, I don't know how many percent of the population trans is a small fraction of that. So I'm still really interested in the liminal web um, in terms of like, what do we bring to it? Like there, to, like, to me, like there's a like, sense of like magic and beauty and wonder, the kind of neatness that you said that you spoke of earlier, <laughs> like with being queer a lot of the time, or there can be some resonance to that, like the kind of a shamanic resonance or something inherent in it, and it could be utilized. And we can, we can, you know, step bravely into that, as some people have said, and, and really look at our shadow and, and add value to the space rather than saying, rather than like doing a zero, zero sum kind of thing, right? Like making space for ourselves and, and kind of budging into the area and making people afraid that they can't say certain things and just leaving it at that. I know this will put you on the spot and because it's a very complex thing, but how would, you define, <laughs> how would you define the words queer and liminal? How do you relate to those words? Yeah, queer. I was just thinking about this this week. Like one definition that I like to use, first of all, not like a, a, a choice to kind of go against categorizations or not like a, a deliberate, willful decision that people make um, so much at least essentially, so much as um, a helpless strangeness to your being that that in this sense, 
um, coincides with deeply held beliefs by society or or maybe even like deeply innate instinctual things about us as animals that really, you know, cause friction in some people's minds regarding the way things should be. Or just just kind of provide a little bit of um, interesting unsettling of things um, to people who maybe are more okay with it, attuned to it, open to it. But that there there is something about it that really you know defies. It's the intercategorical, you know, like Verveke would say, and um, there can be a horror associated with that, like a real like disgust or like you know hatred of that, um, as well as a sense of wonder and, and magic that can come out of it. So. Any of those like like deep like left-handed was pretty queer at a certain point, and for some people still is, right? Like that was you know forbidden, and we know all about the history of that stuff in like the Catholic Church and so on. Um, I know people personally who have had their hands beaten in school <laughs> um, who are still alive. So you know that to me is another one of those deep identity issues that for some reason we seem to like gravitate around as being like if you're not this way, it's a problem. Um, if you're not in this binary, so to speak, it's a problem. I like that phrase, the helpless strangeness to someone's being. Mm. I remember my my mom was a girl guide instructor, and she was upset when they uh, were going to remove the word gay from the girl guide sort of anthem. They had this song, at least in Canadian girl guides, oh. um, because she was concerned that the the word has very broad classic applicability and doesn't refer just to a particular contemporary um, sociosexual designation. Yeah. I, I think about that with queer as well, because there's a, uh, there's a lot of ways. And when you, when I think about the, the shamanic type of person, right They're they're queer. And, and a lot of the people who fill up liminal spaces got there because their, their self search and their thinking and their sense of identity didn't stop uh, with what was socially conventional, they continued to move into new spaces because yes. they felt like the existing structures couldn't contain them properly. They felt queer in a peculiar way. There was a strangeness to their being, most of them. Yeah. So I'm I'm interested in the in the way in which the the broad applicability of that term could be recovered to some extent without uh, doing any injustice to people who are using it specifically around sexual and gender identity issues. Right. Yeah. Super good question. I mean, that goes back to Socrates being the monstrous, right? Like he was helplessly queer in that way. <laughs> like totally, you know, he died for it. And it was just something that was part of his being by that point. You know, if it, if it wasn't innate, it became intrinsically part of him. Um, so in that wider sense, total, yes. And, and what you said, like, I also am like, there is a sense in which queer has to maintain its like political viability just out of necessity you know self-defense basically like we need to say and also you know these particular categories are considered so transgressive that they should be banned from society by certain people but again there's crossover there right because they killed socrates they they a lot of people who are very threatening you know in in i don't know neurodivergent ways or other ways you know could also be considered queer in that wider sense so I don't like to draw hard lines with it. I like to kind of think of it as like a blossoming effect, like maybe, you know, gender and sexuality queerness is like, like the center of the flower and it kind of grows out from there for, for people who are that kind of queer, but like for other people, it doesn't, obviously it doesn't have to come from that. You know, I think there's a resonance between us and the shamanic, like I was saying, but that there doesn't, you know, you can totally, you know, like, um, oh, that politician guy, you know, like, um, Mayor Pete, you know, like he did not strike me as queer at all, really, for the most part, <laughs> like as a person, like I know, you know, he's queer, but it just, it's like that, that's like the counter example, I guess, like someone who is like, so like straight, seemingly straight laced, at least as a public face, that you don't get that sense of like, oh, this is like drag queen magic happening here. Alexander Bard, I don't know if you've paid attention to any of his work, but he's spoken about, this is on what we were just discussing, that this overlap between how he sees it, uh, the natural percentage of the human population that falls outside of 
cisgender and heteronormativity and the natural percentage of people that he calls shamanoids who are neurogenetically capable of and instinctively driven to the skills and practices and experiences we symbolically associate with shamanic intermediaries. Mm. Uh, so we don't want to overgeneralize that correspondence. It's clearly not identical, these two groups. But mm. I've found one of the common possible indicators of the shamanoid type is a kind of indifference or non-standard relationship to conventional community gender roles. Mm -hmm. Like if I put myself in that category, I remember my mom telling me I couldn't wear this shirt to school because it was a girl's shirt. And it was like my brain literally couldn't process what she was saying. The <laughs> idea that I would try to align my self-presentation with common village categories had no meaning for me at all. Uh, and I'm curious about you. How did you... How did you relate to the impressions of gender roles and gender presentations that you got from other people as a kid? Yeah, um, conversely, I tried to fit in those, um, but it was sort of a like, what the fuck ever kind of attitude that I eventually adopted, like, just like punk, like I'm gonna wear army green and a trench coat to school and I just don't care about how I look and I'm just going to let my facial hair grow randomly and just, you know, smell bad or whatever. <laughs> it's sort of like that became my eventual like giving up period of time um, that I'm still recovering from to some extent. But um, yeah, I just it didn't it didn't fit with me either, you know, and especially like relationally, because for me, like the way that, you know, men are supposed to behave in our culture is not how I relate to people whatsoever, um, most of the time, you know. And so that became like this, I just like was like, I don't get it. And I've, I've been friends with a lot of women and a lot of cis guys in the liminal space are friends with a lot of women and vice versa, you know, I've discovered. But, um, you know, it just it felt so weird to me to try to to match socially with people and that eventually became my like real like the deepest impetus for me in transitioning had to do with like the or the first the first time i really felt dysphoria like this dissatisfaction right with gender um was was when i like really regretted not being a better sister to my brother like not having like grown up that way and been this better person relationally so that was kind of like as far as gender roles go, like, that's where I feel like I've healed the most, like being someone who can like work with people in a more feminine way, talk with people in a more feminine way and, and lean into that rather than kind of a more stereotypically masculine verbal and body language presentation. That idea, that uh, yearning to be a better sister to your brother is really interesting um, because a lot of the work around wisdom development today involves um, how we relate to a version of ourself that holds virtue and wisdom for us as an ever-present ideal to move towards. Did you you felt like your uh, your virtue and wisdom ideal had had a female gender? Yeah, totally. I was I was so stuck, Layman. I was like, I had this like massive mystical experience well for me massive like one of the bigger ones um related to like compassion and universal you know belonging and and how you can just be naturally agopic toward others um and i felt like stuck with it like i i like couldn't like achieve that that sense you know and this was like right before i transitioned or started to like experience dysphoria directly um before that it was a sense of like just kind of not fitting i was always like i don't fit with the guys i don't fit with the girls i don't really know what my deal is like when I was in middle school or I wanted to the aliens to come and like take me away to my home planet. <laughs> like literally I would like dream of this on the walk to school every day or at least a lot of days. So yeah, I, I feel like for me and you know, the meaning of being queer has to go way beyond this individualistic self that's like claiming an identity, right? Like people say like, oh, just you transition for yourself or, you know, do your thing for yourself and make it, make it work for you. And I'm like, that doesn't give me the meaning that, that I need. That's not like why I'm doing this in the first place. Like the original meaning for it was relational to begin with. And I, I just feel like this is where <laughs> like I, I diverge from a lot of the queer culture, the pop culture version of queer where I'm like, no, it's like to be a better person in general, to have virtue, to be able to like 
you know, I saw this reflected in my life. Like people were like, oh, you're happier now. You're more effective now. I felt happier. I felt more effective. You know, like I was checking the boxes off much more quickly. You know, I entered into these spaces, which I never would have, um, you know, and just felt so much more free, even with all the hardships that come with transitioning. I feel happier, certainly less drunk than I was (laughs) before I transitioned by far. So, you know, it probably saved my life, um, but it also was in conju- inherently in conjunction with others. And I feel like if you if you don't get that when you're transitioning, it's a real, this is where some of the shadow is going to come in, right? It's going to be like, you're going to cut yourself off from like what gender even is. Like it's a relational reality in our culture, in any culture, in any primate species. <laughs> so like, <laughs> this is this is the realism, right? You think a lot of two things stood out to me, but I'll go to the one first, which is a, a bunch of the trans shadow might be the result of insufficient uh, community while undergoing transition. Mm-hmm. Totally. Yeah. Like a sense of like a lack of that supporting network that also reminds you to be a part of that supporting network, not just for yourself, but for others, you know, at least your family, at least your loved ones, you know, and hopefully extending outward beyond that. Um, you know, but, but having a, um, role models, I guess, for lack of a better term, you know, in in the sense of like personal transformation, you kind of need often need someone to at least aspire toward a model of. So, um, that's really helpful to me. Um, and you do, you see some obviously in culture, but it would be nice to have like a generalized model that was like, Hey, like you belong here in the world and you can contribute and matter to something outside of yourself, you know, and it, the world can make more sense because you will make more sense to yourself and you'll make more sense to others too. Like before I transitioned, like, I feel like there was something socially, like just, I described it as like dull, like underwater metallic thuds or sheet metal screaming banshee scraping feelings, like just not connecting with people socially. And like, this has made it so much easier to be able to use my, I guess, innate abilities as well as to develop virtue. So many of those issues are common to these different themes that we're approaching, right? I think that the the, the queer and the liminal and the shamanic all sort of face that question of, uh, and often they don't even realize they're facing that question, but it's the question of how do you make sense of yourself if the world isn't making sense of you, doesn't have any any hunch that you actually occupy one of the normal roles, regardless of how many people are in that role, this is one of the normal things for people to uh, think in a metacognitive fashion and be aligned with emergent cultural sensibilities, right? To have these different relationships to body and sexuality and gender and transformation, right? Or to be um, equipped with some of the shamanic inclinations. Mm -hmm. Those are all seemingly among the normal spread uh, of human variation. Mm -hmm. And to be in a culture that doesn't make it obvious that those are regular choices makes it a lot harder for us to Uh, make sense of ourselves and a lot harder to play any constructive role in the general village life. Yes. Yeah. And like, I feel like we could be like the kind of fun example for people under, under good conditions. I think we are a lot of the time, like, uh, you know, more like cishet people can like look at trans and queer people and just be like, Oh, that's an example of fitting into a role and, and being part of society in the way that only you can be. And anyone, everyone has that, of course, that uniqueness. So it's, it, it's nice to see, you know, like, I'm kind of like riffing off of like Fanny Norland's like gender ideas, but um, like, for instance, like, like some gay men, like stereotypically maybe, but like, <clears throat> well, um, sort of bring out in, in, in like cis women, like this sort of like fun, sexy, you know, playful dancing side to them that it seems like they don't get to express a lot in our culture or like kind of like, you know, they're stuck in more of that like submissive or like um, more, more tr- like feminine role in terms of like taking care, nurturing or whatever, providing or worrying about people <laughs> and trying to help them or whatever. Um, but not just like the free having fun you know, total like feminine yang, as I would call it, like the unbridled sexuality, unbridled, like sort of energy of that, that just is very carefree. So that's like one example of how like a queer person can 
can allow a cis, uh, you know, hetero person to like reflect on that and say, Hey, I can, I can take some of this that works for me. You know, it doesn't have to be the whole thing at all. I think that's the whole point, right. Is that we all have that potential in us, but there are some generalized maybe ways that gender and sexuality work that queer and trans people can help with specifically. And I haven't gotten very specific in my own thinking, but like, that's an example that I brought up, um, you know, where like you can see a symbiosis developing with the so-called like fag hag thing that like, it's like a really beautiful, you know, kind of social thing to me. I had a great, healthy, very accepting home life, and I'm pretty uh, almost simplistically anchored <laughs> in my male identity, but I also wanted the aliens to come and take me away. <laughs> <laughs> so like a part of that can be like imagined as uh, sort of uh, one's nature not fitting into the social niche in which one's being raised, but also part of that is I think the eternal shamanic inclination to access other and transformed realities and feel some kind of contact with uh, non-human or unusual entities of various kind. Like, I think that's <laughs> a strong theme. <laughs> that makes total sense to me. Uh, what else was I going to say? Oh, yeah. I, um, when I was a kid, I saw David Duchovny as a cross-dressing FBI agent on Twin Peaks. And I remember thinking, oh, that looks like it could be liberating and energizing, um, which I, I ended up trying that for a while. And it was. And it reminds me of that's one of those things, like you were saying, that gay men could bring out in some cishet women, right? Mm -hmm. A certain kind of energetic liberation. There can be an encouragement and a space holding for different ways of relating that aren't necessarily going to define that person in their general social function, but which mm -hmm. is one of the affordances built into their nature that they need to be able to exercise at times. Yes. Yeah. To avoid kind of like, you know, I think, I don't remember exactly how Fanny Norland describes this, but to avoid kind of like a toxic feminine in this case, like that kind of worried, fretful, maybe passive nurturing mode only, you know, like, like as one. And of course, like, I don't think that any person lacks masculine and feminine, you know, in totality, like, you know, but just to oversimplify things for a minute, you know, to be able to like get the other end of this loop going so that you're just a healthier, more vibrant person in general. And then, you know, both poles of the feminine, so to speak, can be fully expressed. Let's talk about, you mentioned this just before we started recording, the question of embodiment, because the the extended liminal webs and all the overlapping cultures and thinkers there, it's a, it's a place where the concept of embodiment is really being uh, foregrounded by a lot of people uh, as a fundamental, often overlooked aspect of our, our development and our nature and our value making and meaning making systems. But there's not a lot of experience there of changing bodies. Uh, then conversely, there are communities where people are going through body changing, but where they might not have a lot of spiritual and or philosophical relationship to the principle of embodiment itself. So how do you think about those things relating to each other? Yeah, that's an extremely great way of framing the whole issue. I really, I feel like, you know, from my end of things, I, I spent many years studying like bodywork therapy, rolfing, um, you know, Asian bodywork therapy and doing Tai Chi and doing meditation and doing um, Feldenkrais, you know, like all kinds of like somatic types of activities prior to transition, which I really think gave me a leg up, so to speak, um, because you know, I could feel not only like the needing to accommodate the shifting in my body, or, you know, that was happening due to hormone therapy, um, which is a huge area in itself, like, how, you know, as your spinal curves deepen, and you start to flow more in your movements, or maybe like for a trans guy, it's the opposite. But I had to like, really like, learn to, to be in my body in that way to really actually feel <clears throat> mentally like I was, you know, doing the thing I should be doing, playing the role I should be playing. So not only that, but also just a sense of like, not denying the sometimes harsh reality of the body that I have, you know, and that trans people have. And I, I see that like an escapism or like 
it's, and again, it's like, there's rooted, there's oppression all over the place. So it's, I can see where this would come from, but there's like a sense of like, don't ever talk. Don't, I don't know, I don't know how to say it. Like, it's like, don't talk about your genitals. Don't talk about your junk. Like, or don't like, you know, like think about if someone ever asks you a question about it, it's always like the worst question they could ever ask you or something. You know what I mean? Like, I get that you don't, I'm not going to ask you about your genitals, but like, you know what I mean? I'm like, it's also, I don't know, to understand, to, to just have such an extreme reaction sometimes that I've seen, um, like trans pro trans people, um, you know, have with regard to these issues. Like it's almost, it's like a body denialism, which is again, where I think some of the anti-trans people have some, some points, right? Like they can, they can gain some ground on that because if you like, don't accept yourself, someone will exploit that. Someone will find that fault, you know, and, and use it in some way. Um, so for me, it also includes things like phantom genitalia. Like I have a phantom vagina sometimes that shows up and it's like, how do you deal with that energy that emerges in you? You know, it's like, you want that, um, the feminine yang to happen. Like you want that full expression of yourself, but like, it also has to be done differently. So, you know, I guess this is like full disclosure moment for me, <laughs> kind of, um, personal, but like, yeah, I haven't gone through that surgery in particular. So like, you know, like, I still have to deal with this fact that my brain seems to think that my body should be a different way. And it seems to like actually experience it in a different way um, at times. So like energetically, like, you know, I've heard you and Scout talk a little bit about chakras and that was really cool to hear. Um, but like, you know, I'm just like wondering like how to tap into that, you know, without having the physical parts, you know, whether or not the energy actually exists, like there's definitely an existence, um, subjectively for me. Yeah. There's a, <laughs> regardless of what our idea about the ontological status of subtle energy is, there are stimulating and imaginal structures that we're interfacing with of various kinds that this, that, I mean, dysphoria itself is very fascinating, right? There's a sense in which Greg and I have actually talked about this a lot, that sort of the transition into the justification system goes through uh, what they sometimes call the mirror phase, where you build up a body image before you have an actual like symbolic ability to reference yourself. And you build up that image, whether, and some animals can do this, the animals that recognize themselves in a mirror have an individual body image, not just a body. And the body image is built on observations they make, you know, in mirrors and puddles of other creatures. So it's kind of like a Frankenstein monster. It's not mm -hmm. correct objectively, right? So yeah. everybody ends up with a slightly incorrect body image. And we know that there's people who have eating disorders who, as scrawny as they are, they think they're fat people. So we want to address that dysphoria by yeah. psychologically and neurologically adapting themselves to their real body. And yet right. there's this other side where we think, well, there might be cases or versions of this where we actually want to adapt the body to the neurology and the psychology. And it's very yeah. interesting that we have to keep both of those directions in mind, it's sort of like yeah. thinking top down and bottom up at the same time. Totally. Yeah. I kind of wonder like if the neurology is more of the driver rather than the psychology, it makes more sense maybe to do that, yeah. to adapt the body, you know, cause it's like, if it's a genetic thing that your brain evolves this yeah. way, you know, the brain, I mean, what are we, if we're not, you know, including our brains as humans, right? Like that's like the coolest part about us. So like, and the most like innate to our sense of self compared to any other body part. So like, I kind of, I feel like with Sapolsky, you know, like the brain gets the biggest vote is how he put it. And that that's how it should be in this case. But then there are other cases where maybe not, or what if someone's like kind of on the fence, like their brain is maybe like non-binary and they like, don't know whether they should transition physically or not, or partially, or just like, maybe they should try to psychologically overcome that somehow, you know, totally makes sense. Right. Like even a trans person totally makes sense. Maybe you decide, yeah, I'm trans, but I don't want to do that. You know? and maybe figure out ways that you can like do something like how they work with like phantom limb pain and things like that. That's a really interesting thing. Like it, when I was mentioning, you know, the idea of like, maybe you could set up a wise system for differentiating different types of experience people are going through that would then be amenable to different types of outcomes. But it, it's really neat to think that there would be some people who are on the fence 
you know, in terms of their brain body relationship where they could go either way. They might be somewhat dissatisfied with either direction or, you know, like there's all kinds of different things, but it would be really important to be able to distinguish, you know, whether it's 60, 40 or 50, 50, like that's a very important part of setting up a wise system to adjudicate these things. Right. And then adding that into that, the cultural level where it's like, okay, but you know, are you in a culture where this particular, if you're a masculine, if you're a male body person who has a lot of feminine identity, does the culture like hold that? And, and you're also non-binary, you know, um, in your brain, you know, like how does this all, where does, yeah. Yeah. It's a really, it's a really interesting field for me. I want to, I just wanted to say like um, the kind of the, the subtype of, transgender that I sort of resonate with the most is called bigender, okay. which is where you kind of have a fluctuation a little bit between your genders. Like I eventually came down on the side of, you know, I tell people two thirds female, that's sort of when I like loosely just toss at people as a shorthand. But um, there are, for some of us, like uh, there's an actual, at um, Ramachandran's lab studied this, like where there's like a, a flipping in the in the body map that occurs. Um, if people have a really extreme form of this where they're like one day they're fine with their body and the next day it's intolerable and something strange is happening, you know, like they were speculating with like a corpus callosum might be involved or something with the brain hemispheres. And that might be doing this to people, but like, like there are cases like this that kind of, that show like the, the, that highlight the issue so well. By gender makes me think of, and it's not exactly the same thing, but this phrase two spirited that's become popular in the last few years. I'm curious what you make of that term, but I'm also curious what you think the extra abilities and responsibilities are that we might expect from someone with a more than average number of souls. <laughs> <laughs> don't, don't make me go to work more, Layman. Like <laughs> But yeah, no, seriously, like it's like the 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 the, nego- the membranic person, right? Like to kind of use some bardic terminology, like I would I would say like you know, like that feels like my role in the world. Like especially, I guess I can speak from personal experience and like the the two spirit thing, you know, I like I'm a little hesitant to to dive into that as <laughs> non-native and I'm not versed in native culture traditions, et cetera. But I will say it totally resonates with me though, you know, even though like, I don't like claim that, that specific terminology, but it feels very much like the membranic figure to me. Like I want to, I'm the person that kind of like flits between groups that sort of like cross pollinates, cross communicates, you know, um, learns different people's languages and tries to like work between them. Um, I don't tend to have a a stable sense of home in the world. I went through many years of like, what am I even doing here? You know, like um, kind of looking for the one, the one thing that the culture as a, as a male body person, you know, like, especially I was like, I have to have a purpose. I have to have this thing that I do that, you know, makes me this important person or whatever. <laughs> kind of embarrassing to look back on it. But at this point, you know, it's like, no, that's really not who I am. I feel like even more, then maybe even a lot of queer people, I feel like I just belong in the liminal. Like that, that is my home. Like, I don't feel like it'll ever be different from that really. You have a, like, if a percentage of queer and non-queer populations contain people who are liminally or shamanically disposed, do you think it's about the same or from your own experience, does it, you seem like there's a higher percentage of those people in queer communities? Oh yeah. You know what I'm going to say? Higher. Definitely. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. I just, I just like by necessity almost just like by like how we come up in the world, you know, we, we don't fit. We we're looking for the aliens and like, so then we go on to explore other things. I think a lot of the time, And there's just like, I don't know how to explain this. You know, you hear the term queer magic kind of thrown around on bumper stickers or whatever. But when I was transitioning and I still try to follow this, this sense, um, there's like, there was this initial burst of like, like glowing flowers in the darkness that like appeared to me, like what had been this dark, mysterious, gloomy place in my life suddenly was like filled with this glowing light that was also mysterious but beautiful at the same time, you know? And I noticed that like, when I 
push my transition or my identity too hard in any direction, I lose touch with that magic. You know, it's it's like, oh, it, it dried up, it died. Like I have to like get back in the river and follow it wherever it wants to go, which prevented me from being like a super binary trans person because I was like, oh, I can't just, I can't just do that. It's like a totally anti- antithetical to like, being the authentic person that the trans revolution is supposed to be about. So I had to kind of like, okay, like let's keep steering with the current and that's, that's where home is, you know? So like that, based on my experience, I would say definitely greater. And just based on kind of like the little tidbits you hear about like indigenous culture and, you know, two spirited people or people of extra genders kind of performing special roles in societies. Well, not to make extra work for you, but somebody's <laughs> going to have to be involved in um, creating a, a more stable discourse that discerns the difference between people who just happen to be going through uh, queer, trans, you know, yeah. non cishet experience and those who are going through it as proto-liminal or proto-shamanic experience because in the first case we'd say well a lot of the things you're suffering are problematic aspects of your marginalization and in the second case we'd say some of it's problematic marginalization and some of it's the normal birth pangs of an additional set of interests and capacities and those would need to be skillfully teased apart uh, by somebody who has some experience of it. And that to me, that's like not work. That's, that's, that's love. That's like, you know what I mean? Like definitely for me, that's, that's totally it. <laughs> Thank you for your masculine young, like ordering of the situation. <laughs> but yeah, like I totally agree. And that's an, an extremely important. It's hard in the wide, wider culture, but I'm at least hoping within the liminal web that there can be, you know, room for that kind of upbringing for people who are who are new to the space or new to I was I was thinking this morning about you know there's a there's a liminal concern with the future and with the meta crisis and the the time period that we're going into and I I had this feeling that a lot of the pressure of the future ambiguity of biology is falling at the moment onto transgender people but actually mm-hmm. it pertains to something much larger like the element of sexuality makes it an obvious flashpoint but but a flashpoint for a haunting anxiety that we've already strayed into a time in which basic biological identities are amenable to modification and transformation. Like this sort of uh, uh, conservative fantasy phobia that kids are um, thinking they're cats and shitting in boxes at school. <laughs> like that's nonsense, but it's not nonsense that you could have feline DNA injected into your body, or you could uh, genetically splice your fetus to have some cat traits like that's available to us already. So we're going into a situation where sex Mm -hmm. and reproduction are separated. We have the capacity as a species to make and undo the nature of species now. So we're entering into something that rightly freaks us out. uh, But unjustly a lot of that freak out is falling on the example we have which is the transgender example yeah which is like an example that actually occurs in chimpanzees like which is the irony of this whole thing to me you know like like we we've been around for a long time we're not just a future a transhumanist you know ideological thing as opposed to injecting cat dna into ourselves for instance so yeah, like that's where I, I again I keep coming back to like grounding this in in a reality, yeah. like grounding gender like in some kind of somewhat fluid ontology that makes sense to us. I, I'm curious, and I, I I don't know how well read you are in queer studies, but I found that uh, Jermaine Marvel has done a really useful thing by bringing in certain black thinkers into the meta modern discourse. Um, Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering, maybe we both don't know, but there must be ideas and thinkers from queer studies that would have principles that would be useful to liminal culture. I bet you're right. You know, I've, I've so far skirted around going to college or anything specific with academia. (laughs) And I've also kind of skirted around mainstream queer studies for all the reasons we've been discussing. Um, like identity politics and stuff like that. And, and seeing that everything seems to be about oppression only. Um, but I think you're right. There's probably a ton of stuff, you know, there are good, I mean, like 
ContraPoints is an amazing example of like a trans philosopher who's doing really, really cool stuff, like, you know, at least liminal adjacent a lot of the time. Um, and, you know, she's not like a queer studies major as far as I know, but she's deeply embedded in the issues at hand and all the nuances and complexities of which trans man is, is the devil according to other trans people on Twitter or something like that, you know, which is super helpful. It's, it's like, that's to me, that's like the dirty work that gets done. Like, I'm not, I'm not doing that kind of work personally, but to see that happening is really heartening to me that someone is willing to undertake it, that burden and sort of lead us toward um, bridging the gap between queer and liminal. My partner and I just this morning watched the, uh, the hunger episode of ContraPoints and it was very clearly had like a, a traditional modernist and postmodernist character interfacing with each other from out of the same person so that was great and I, there is a lot of uh, a lot of interest a lot of circulation of contrapoints i think in the liminal webs are there is there anybody else that you go to like in, in as a pop culture philosopher who you think nails some of the overlap between these domains yeah i think um philosophy tube abigail thorne is another example of a trans i don't know what it is with trans women being philosophers on youtube but it just happens, I guess. <laughs> That's pretty much, I would like to find more personally because I feel, well, actually, you know, Aidan Connor is really um, an interesting thinker in these domains too. Um, I don't want to leave him out, but um, I, I want to find more people like who are queer, queer adjacent, you know, or whatever, just thinkers that can start to help bridge this because like, all this stuff I'm talking about is like intuitions and inklings and, and, you know, sparks from conversations that I've had up to now with people, but I've kind of felt like just a real loner in this, um, which I get is part of my sort of destiny. I feel like at this point, but you know, it would be really cool to see, like, I mean, you know, even like I, we've been talking about trans a lot, but like just queer in general, you know, asexual or something, people just like kind of being able to give their their slice of the pie and, and participate in these conversations and move them forward. So I, I see I'm looking at like two imaginal pictures here. One is the importance of someone operating liminally and shamanically within the extended queer communities. And then the other one is a lot of people from those communities operating that way relative to the general population. Mm -hmm. uh, those are sort of two slightly different uh, analogous schematic functions. Um, but the, the, the notion of those functions is really interesting to me because so much of the discourse, uh, let me back up. I'm a big fan of Nietzsche and Nietzsche had a, a, a wide correspondence with a lot of the people who were the early feminists in the 1800s. And one of the things that comes up in his letters is him saying to them, look, be cautious here. You've got to make sure that uh, what you think of as normativity and equality with men is actually a step up for you and not a step down into a disempowering situation that they happen to already be in. So just just go carefully here. You're right. Yeah. Uh, um, overcoming the sense of being um marginalized or reduced in social status doesn't necessarily put you in a good place it might or it might not uh mm -hmm. so like normally the discourse i hear is about how to get um how to get to normal how to get to fair how to get to equal rights but there's another possible discussion which is how to train up for special privileges and responsibilities um mm -hmm. i would love there for that to be that additional conversation i'm just not hearing it uh, yeah, totally. I, I love this nudge you're giving because like, I feel like that's, and so like, I, like, I don't, you know, like in the long run, I've, always, I've been thinking like, I don't care if I'm called like just a woman or a trans woman or trans femme or something, you know what I mean? Like personally, like, I just, I feel like that's not important to me so much as what you're talking about. Like what, what am I supposed to be doing here? <laughs> Basically, you know, like, like, we evolved somehow for a reason. And so like, what is that? And what does it mean in, in the context of the new world and the future and, and all that, like, how do, do I like, well, both as a woman now, you know, perceived as a woman, like when I go places, I, people 
apparently don't notice that I'm trans, which is always surprising to me, but like people haven't realized this for a while now. And so like, how do I also take on, oh, like a version of that, that really, I don't know. I I always just say feels right because it, it just comes so much naturally to me to like, like, oh, to like smile at people when I see them on the street. Right. Like, like that's, that's considered an oppressive thing, right? Like to tell a woman to smile, like, you know, uh, you know, of course, like it's really obnoxious a lot of the time, but like, like, I really enjoy that instinctively. Like I like smiling at people. I like, I'm like, oh, I'm brightening their day as I'm walking by them or whatever, you know, like, so I, I don't, and as, as a, as a man, I couldn't do that. Right. It would just, people would like get kind of creeped out or whatever. <laughs> so and now people are like, you know, kids and people are like happy to smile back at me and all that stuff. So like, this is an example of where like, it could be oppression or it could be this neat role that I'm filling in the world that like really feels right to me. Um, so there's like the being the woman, then there's being the trans person. And both of those like are interesting, like to look at as in terms of their interplay for me in, in working on this issue that you're describing. Yeah, it seems like there has to be a, a real... Not, not comfort, but ability to tolerate ambiguity in order to even explore this, because the, obviously there is a lot of, like you were saying with women, there's uh, there's not just an oppressive masculine to feminine thing about telling women to smile, but there's this general cultural suppression of anything that looks like negative affect, like you're, yeah. you're incorrect to have a negative feeling. We're like, yeah. don't be sorry. Or, you know, we, we always <laughs> tell people not to have their negative affects as if we're helping them. Uh, yeah. So that's a huge problem, right? And then there's this additional huge problem of trying to create a society in which um, it, it's more fair, it's more welcoming, it's more safe for all different kinds of people. So that's huge. But the the ambiguity between that and this other set of functions where you would say, yeah. okay, what what helpful role are you performing to these other people? How are you giving them joy how are you giving them comfort and ambiguity how are you demonstrating that whatever type you are is actually something that's not only accept not only tolerable but needed in the village life and then how do you come across to do that well that's a really interesting question and it's an unnecessary burden to place on a lot of people but there's some people who might be able to face that question yeah some of us seem unable to avoid it for some reason but you know yeah i mean it's just like like tall people and short people. I mean, you know, a tall person can grab something off the top of a shelf. A short person can fit in a low space. Like these are just realities that we face and we can't just be like, oh no, everyone's the same. And we can't, you know, like the part, this is celebration of difference that I'm really looking for, right? Like the celebration and the utilization of that and the fun of it. Like that's, that's life. It's, it's the magic of it. Not like flat equality, you know, as the only, you know, value or something. Definitely. Definitely. Hard agree. Uh, I don't expect you to have the answer to this question, but it's a good question going forward. Is like, what's the skill set necessary for, uh, I don't know, shamanic gender tenders, or like how do the, the gardeners of <laughs> of queer souls and the queer gardeners of all souls, uh, what capacities do they need to teach each other to be better at? Holy shit! Okay. Yeah. I mean, the ambiguity thing is huge, right? You you touched on that already. Um, but, you know, because right now, like a lot of people who are queer, like would love to just jump into a new box out of the box that they're in and, and, and not even think about the fact that they used to be in a different box or something like that. Um, so that's important to kind of like be able to help others tolerate ambiguity. Um, obviously, like some basics like cognitive flexibility, you know, is important. So the ability to like reflectively listen and do all that kind of great, you know, peer presencing kind of thing that you would find in like authentic relating or something like that. Um, all those skills I think are important. Gosh, you gotta be able to really, well, I don't know if this is generally a, a queer thing, but like you have to really understand some things so differently from culture that you need to be, I mean, the, I guess generally open-mindedness as an attribute, obviously that, that makes sense. But I was thinking like, um, I was talking with Adriana about this and, and um, I, I was like, do you think that like women have different boundaries, like, or like ways of doing boundaries than men do? Because I feel like this, the thing about like holding a firm boundary, like just doesn't work for me at all. Like, I, I feel like boundaries are something that like 
are sometimes outside me, sometimes inside me and that I dance with more often. Like I, you know, I can sometimes put up that like masculine firm boundary, so to speak, but like, you know what I mean? Like, so I had to like, I had to like allow that to occur to me. And that is something, I mean, I think that's a philosophical thing in general, right? Like if you're a philosopher, like you're a person who allows things to occur to you a lot of the time, but like, I wouldn't have done that if I, if I weren't like, like full of this wonder and curiosity about it and wanting the magic and the beauty more than I wanted security to some extent. There's a couple starting points. I might have yeah, to yeah, good. <laughs> more of, this is a great question though. Like I, I love this like discourse because I'm like, oh yeah, this is this is a really great idea to kind of move this forward. It it excites me. I feel like it's a dharma that's waiting to happen. <laughs> yes. Totally a dharma in waiting. Uh, another thing came up for me, and it's a it's a difficult thing uh, in, in thinking about how do you have a benevolent interface with a culture that's full of uh, narrowly Christian people to some degree. But there's this connection. Uh, another element of queer liminal can be viewed through the lens of occult and magical and alchemical movements in history, because those movements were, I think, at the same time, custodians of shamanic practice in non-shamanic cultures and protective networks for people developing socially and cognitively beyond the dominant standard of their society, and also notoriously populated by queer and alternative sexuality. Right? Mm -hmm. It was sometimes just because people needed those spaces to meet outside the view of church and state, <laughs> and sometimes it was because people actively wanted to challenge their habits and identities, uh, mm -hmm. And sometimes because altered state experiences can radically adjust your sense of identity and body and eros and things. Wow. In, in my mind, I, I think of famous uh, like bisexual and gay occultists like Aleister Crowley and William Burroughs. And yeah, mm -hmm. uh, I'm sorry, folks, I only know the famous white poet author ones, but uh, it, it seems like it could be a very general phenomenon. What, what's your take on the historical oh. intersection of queer occult and developmental spaces. Oh, that's so interesting. Like I'm like absolutely ignorant, but um, it did bring up like, like I work in community mental health and like, I would say like, I joke that it's like 90% of the queer kids that I work with or queer teens want to do tarot and they have a tarot, they have like 10 tarot decks and they have some crystals, you know? And I'm just, I'm like watching this, like what? Like, I mean, A, they're like, yeah, like the reasons you mentioned, like maybe they're, they reject like normal religions for the usual reasons. Um, but there's like a real interest there, like in this kind of spirituality that does tap into the occult. And I hadn't really thought about it historically before. I've just been noticing it in the present tense. So this is really interesting to hear about like, oh, maybe it's like a perennial thing that just kind of happens, you know, like we're just drawn to it. I am out of the things I thought of to say in this interview. Um, <laughs> what about you? Is, is there anything still uh, we need to address? Anything that's uh, half emerged for you? I feel pretty satisfied, like satiated. Um, you know, there's so much that, that's like bubbled up that I like, I'm going to just probably bubble on for a while now. And, and this is how I usually do things. I think really slowly or I process slowly and just kind of, go with it so I'm, I'm very appreciating this chance to talk with you about this stuff i knew this was going to be a, a fun you know pot stirring and hopefully not you know splattering and getting burned with the cauldron <laughs> but but just like moving things that need to get moved like like trying to help that the dharma in waiting sort of move forward i think it's it feels really fruitful to me like my heart feels good as a result so yeah about it good well let's uh let's stay in touch about the dharma in waiting and let's uh remind everyone hashtag queer liminal let's get that phrase moving around <laughs> uh this has been tremendous fun rachel thanks for doing this thank you so much me too